Hi, everybody. Um, so I am Hannah. Oh my God, Adam. Oh man, Chris. Get. I'm sorry. I need to focus. Tim Frakes. This is so nice. Oh my God. I feel like I haven't seen anyone in forever. Um, so I'm Dr. Jen Sudel Edwards. I'm the chief curator and curator of contemporary art here at the Mint Museum. Um, along with Jamila Brown and Mary Mac Brown, we organize a series called Live at the Mint. It happens here at the Mint Museum the first Wednesday of every month. And it's a series that activates all of the institutions around the Levine Center for the Arts. So the Mint has the first Wednesday, the second Wednesday is at the Beckler, the third Wednesday is Levine Museum of the New South, and that kind of floats around, and then the fourth is at the Gantt. So the point of this was that if you just come to the Levine Center for the Arts any Wednesday night, all the museums are open late and free. We're open until 9 p.m. And you can find a really exciting, weird, challenging, provocative, or just entertaining thing going on at one of these institutions. Um, it was a way that we were trying to enliven uptown again after the pandemic, us all bonding together. Um, so we usually invite performers of some ill, dancers, musicians, uh, poets, um, playwrights, um, and we ask them to do something to engage the artwork that are in our galleries. But we also try to do an educational program a couple of times a year that engages the artists directly to come and talk about their work. Um, we are very honored tonight to host the eight artists, all eight of the artists, I'm so happy everyone showed up, um, for this Echoes exhibition that Dr. Jonathan Stolman organized um, for the Mint's Bearden Galleries. And I'm just remembering I forgot something. Um, Live at the Mint is very grateful to Bank of America for making it all happen. Thank you, Bank of America. Um, we're very appreciative for all they do for us. So Echoes was an exhibition that John actually came up with pre-pandemic. Um, he had wanted to um, bring artists in who have a history with Charlotte, or are new to Charlotte, um, but to directly speak to the legacy of Romer Bearden, who is arguably the most famous artist born here in Charlotte, North Carolina, even though he spent most of his life um, in the North, uh, moved to Pittsburgh and then New York City early in his life, uh, but always would come back to the South and had all of these memories of being in North Carolina, visiting his family, particularly over the summer. Um, so we, uh, John really wanted to have artists come in and examine that legacy, but also to enliven it, to bring some new thoughts and new ideas around the work, particularly responding to this piece that you see up here, which is Bearden's um, of the blues, Carolina Shout. Um, it is arguably the most significant Bearden work that's in the Mint's collection. It's been included in every major Bearden exhibition um, since it was made. It came into the collection in 1975, I was gonna say 76, 1975. It was brought in by the uh, Charlotte Debutante Club um, and it was the first Bearden work to enter the Mint's collection. So it's significant to us in the museum, and we wanted to see how artists would respond to it. Um, unfortunately, John is actually supposed to be leading this conversation tonight. Unfortunately, um, he had a family emergency. Um, everything's gonna be fine, but it was a major emergency, and so um, I've stepped in um, to fill his spot. Um, but John oversees the Beard and Gallery that's part of his domain. He's the American art curator, and part of that is making sure that the Bearden Gallery, a space that we always have reserved in the fourth floor galleries, that is devoted to either Bearden's work or to Bearden's legacy. We've had installations of Elizabeth Catlett in there, for example, an artist who was close friends um, with Bearden, and so there was that synergy between um, their projects. So, um, there's a lot of conversation waiting to happen here. So how I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna give a brief introduction to each person, and then we're gonna open it up to conversation. Um, oh no, we're not, not, I take that all back. 
Each person's gonna have five minutes, three to five minutes to talk about their work. We'll see how that goes. And then um, John sent me a couple of questions, which I'm gonna ask of the panelists. Um, I have a couple of my own too. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. I did wanna mention, this is being recorded. We are gonna have it online after um, this evening um, with closed caption. So if anyone has needs to have closed caption, there will be, uh, it will later be posted online. So I'm gonna start, Juan Logan, I don't know that he needs, I don't know that any of these people need an introduction, but I'm doing this anyway. Um, Juan Logan is um, now one of our most proud legacy leaders of the artists coming out of this area. He lives in Belmont, but he's been known for his work around North Carolina as well as the rest of the country um, for the last 50 years. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to do you. Um, so in addition to all of the work, Juan works in everything, installation, sculpture, painting, printmaking, drawing. Um, but some of you may not know, he is also responsible for maintaining and conserving Vala Simpson's whirly gigs. Um, so I don't want to create a stampede to your studio, but going to a studio is quite an incredible experience because in addition to the multiple football field length uh, work and objects that Juan has for his art. He also has tons and tons of these Vala Simpson pieces. So it's a great experience. Carla Aaron Lopez, who is one of the co-founders of Black Market CLT, is also a also multimedia drawing, printmaking, painting. Um, we'll move into sculpture, I'm sure, at some point, but is also an exceptional curator. Um, and hopefully all of you have seen her local streets installations that have gone on both at Mint Randolph and at this site, as well as the work that she's done at Black Market, at Social Status. Um, so always follow her and I am King Carla. She's always doing exciting things. What? I am King Carla. What did I say wrong? Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Susan Brenner. <laughs> um, Susan Brenner, who taught at UNCC, um, taught in the painting department for a number of decades, this is now retired and doing extraordinary work. Um, a lot of, and I'm sure she'll talk about it, but um, often dealing with the urban landscape and the natural landscape that's fighting to emerge from that uh, urban landscape. And she has an interesting way of showing the tension between. Tom Delaney, who I've just met tonight, which is very exciting. Um, painter, also art and educator at um, uh, Charlotte Country Day School. Malik Norman, who hopefully many of you have seen in other installations, both here at the Mint and local streets, also at Goodyear Arts. Jamila Brown's curated him in shows there at McCall Center. Um, recently graduated from UNCC and is having an incredible career at a very young age. Beverly Smith, who hopefully you have all seen, again, both here at the Mint, she's been featured in Coit in the South, also at Brooklyn Collective, um, uh, also a retired educator, um, and a brilliant quilt maker. Damn it, Wesley, uh, co-founder of Black Market CLT, also seen many times here at the Mint in multiple exhibitions. Um, both at Mint Randolph and at Uptown, a show I did called It Takes a Village, as well as Carlos Local Street Show. Um, he was also participating in our mural art. Honestly, like I go to Damn It Wesley both for advice and for any art project that I have um, because I love working with him and I love what he does. Um, so <laughs> also painting, sculpture, drawing, doing some really interesting work in prints right now and is possibly slowly getting back to sculpture. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and then Lilia Zalavaskaya, um, a wonderful, also a wonderful printmaker who I've been following since she came to Goodyear five years ago, maybe. Um, and beautiful textile work. She just started, you teach digital, art as well, but you've just started really making it and showing it in the last... Oh, you did. Okay. 
Well, I'm really enjoying the piece upstairs. That's I think the first time I've seen your video work. So very excited to see that like coming out in the galleries more. Um, teaches printmaking and digital art at Gaston College. Okay, I introduced everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that alone gets my, gets my applause. Okay, now we'll see how challenged I am with the media, but it's gonna go fine. Um, we are going to, we were gonna do things in alphabetical order, but Juan has a pressing delivery. <laughs> So, you know, two artists through and through. Um, so we're actually going to start with Juan, and I'll advance the slides. But so if you want to start talking, and then I'm going to. I believe this is on. Good evening. Is it on? Yeah. Can you hear me OK? Very good. All right. Um, it was interesting in terms of doing this project because um, I was thinking back to late 80s, early 90s, um, I did a show with Bearden in Philadelphia. And it seemed um, appropriate in a way, uh, because that was just individual work and all that. Um, but it was sort of fun actually uh, responding to his piece. Um, how many of you know James P. Johnson? <gasps> oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. Because James P. Johnson uh, was the inspiration, if you will, uh, for Carolina Shout. Um, he played music, piano. Um, he played in clubs. Bearden was influenced by all that. Uh, so thinking in terms of, um, I mean, and the, call, the name of the piece is Call and Response, and we all know that. Uh, this impossible to n go to any party today, um, generally speaking, depending on the club you're going to, uh, and certainly if you go to any church, there's always call and response. So Bearden was thinking in terms of the, uh, the partying on Saturday night and the worship on Sunday morning, so which is what this piece is all about. So that big blue head on the side there is that person who's doing the call and response. He's doing the calling. And what may be difficult to see all those smaller black areas, are there hundreds of heads in those things all the people who are responding. And if you can see it, you get a hint of the church up top there, uh, maybe just a little. But that's what the piece is essentially about. It's about all of us and the things we do on late Saturday night and early Sunday morning, you know, seeking salvation Sunday morning, potting hard Saturday night. <laughs> but that's what it's about. Um. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the um, James P. Johnson. I was actually listening to it when Jamila came into my office to tell me I need to start moving and get out of here um, to get me in the mood for this. It's ragtime, um, and it's just, it's amazing. You can get it on YouTube. I really recommend checking him out. Carla Aaron Lopez. My picture up there? Yes, it is. Hey, that should go hard. All right, so eternal life through Jesus Christ. Interior, latex paint, big ass strippy markers, pen and ink. How I ended up in this space specifically though is um, at first I could not respond to the image because the image was so close to me. I, if you know anything about the history of black people in art in Charlotte, for a lot of us in old black Charlotte, the poster was the artwork, or you would go to the downtown library and you would rent art to put up in your house. Mm -hmm. So for my entire life, I have been around Romare Beard in pieces, right? So then I saw the image and I started thinking more and more and more, Carolina shout, I'm like, bro, this is a baptism. Shucks, I go to like one of the oldest black churches in Charlotte. There's about three to four of us that have been here since the inception of Brooklyn, right? What am I doing in this space? Everything I thought about was a callback to a memory of being in Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, of hearing my grandmother say out loud that her favorite song is Blessed Assurance, and when her son becomes a head pastor of a church, the entire church sings the song. So it's a very, very important fact for everyone to understand that I clearly have a relationship to music and memory, which is what this entire piece is about. 
I put Mark 15, 16 up there because wherever we are together, then God is present. And this is often spoken during a baptism. Unfortunately, I missed a lot of church, so the music became my confession. My grandma's favorite song is now the sermon. The Clark sisters singing hiya lives rent free because I love it when damn it Wesley screams out hiya on a whim. But then there's also back to life, Sunday service choir, no Kanye. And all of these things, they give me it's such a life that's like, yo, let's, let's slap that on the canvas and see what kind of magic we can make. And that's how we got here. Well, I first want to say thank you to the Mint Museum, to Dr. John Stillman and Dr. Jen Edwards for organizing this show and including me in it. And I want to say that I was so impressed with all the work in the show and the diversity of the work. Everybody took such a different approach. It was really interesting for me to see how that happened. Um, I had the privilege of sitting with John Stillman looking at Carolina Shout um, when it was in a rest period. So we sat in the storage area looking at the piece and it really deserves close looking because it is absolutely beautiful. And Bearden was such an experimenter and he was so innovative with his materials and his techniques. I, I, just, I had so much fun looking at that with John. And um, so when I started my piece, I was really responding more to this improvisational approach that Bearden took and also to his innovation with um, his use of the forms, the colors, the composition, the scale. It's just, it's brilliant. It's, it's really a brilliant piece. And so I tried to take a fairly experimental approach using my materials and to integrate both a response to Carolina Shout and to the work I typically make, as well as to the contemporary context. So my piece ended up being a bit less optimistic than I think Carolina Shout was. Um, although I, I still, I think there is a bit of hope and possibility in there. Um, in Carolina's shout, I loved that he, that Bearden uh, used the song title that um, had more to do with partying and that the image could be both the Saturday, Saturday night party and the Sunday morning service. And so I worked to have this kind of dual possibility in, in my piece as well. So the figures that I placed in water um, might be dancing, they might be fighting, they might be coming into being, and they might be falling apart, and perhaps they're doing all of that at the same time. As Ms. Brenner said, I did want to say thank you very much. I'm very humbled to be among all, invited to be among all of you to show, and thank you to Beverly Smith for the invitation. Um, when we were talking about uh, an independent project we were working on, uh, two days prior, my, I got news that my aunt passed away, and I had I'd been away from my hometown for a, a long time, like decades, but that was all of those memories were very seminal in the way that I grew up and where I grew up and, and how I grew up. And looking at, um, looking at Carolina Shout and realizing that memory is like a collage and recollection is like uh, a nostalgic kind of 
dance in, in the past as you're trying to pull things into the future and find connection and relevance and meaning. That there are layers upon layers upon layers of kind of the why and the who and the when and the how and what to make sense of it. But Romare Bearden did. And I thought that he could be a, a, a guide in that and that we could find connection through that process. So the more that I kind of peeled away from my past as I went back, and the more that I visited sites that I had recollections of this and, and recalling that, um, it, was, it was a bittersweet moment to go back and, well, kind of celebrating life with, with people that I hadn't seen in a long time. And family is really good at reminding you who you used to be. Uh, but also the potential of what you can be. And, you know, all of, all of us through going through the creative process know that it sometimes can be very, very isolating and you go inside very much. And sometimes it's not really fair to our loved ones, our significant others and spouses, and it, and it can be. But that process is, is extremely important and our loved ones respect that and honor that. So I want to say to all of our loved ones, thank you for bearing with us. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for bearing with me. Um, so, finding connections, water, baptism, um, I, I found imagery that I could relate to that I found, I paralleled some of what Bearden was talking about with his baptism, his celebration. And like kids shouting and coming together and dancing in a pool, like birds singing, coming together at a bird bath, that there was joy there, there was history there, there was coming together from various places, but for, if, if not for one brief moment of, of respite. And so I, I found guidance, I, I found hope, I found solace, and although it, it was inspired by a, a, a somewhat depleting event, my aunt's passing, it gave me an opportunity to reconnect uh, with her and with my extended family and it was good because she reminded me to always play fair. Um, regardless who you're playing with or who's coming on the playground, play fair. And I think there are a lot of echoes in that theme in Bearden's work and our work here. So thank you. Thank you. First, we'd like to begin by paying respect to the indigenous land which we are colonized, which was colonized. Um, before Charlotte was Charlotte, it was the land of the Catawba Cherishera people, and they were stewards, stewards of this land for generations. And it, we must do more than knowing and acknowledging and honoring the by and honoring the history of the land of the people who first stepped here. We must keep supporting and listening to today's indigenous and mythicized people while continuing to address the political practices that perpetuate oppression. Within these next moments, I would like to take a silence to honor these lies and mythified people, and then also take a moment to commit to universal justice. Hello, my name is Malik J. Norman. I'm from Mineral Springs, North Carolina, which resides on the unceded territory of the Waxhaw, Chira, Catawba people. I would like to begin by saying thank you to the Mint Museum and the team that organized this, or this exhibition. And it's such a blessing and to be with amazing, extraordinary people that just break borders and create new alignment within this Charlotte area. So thank you for all that you do. <laughs> and um, for me, Coming from Mineral Springs, Western Union Park, which is a historically black realm, uh, looking at Romare Bearden's work, it reminded me of the salvation that my grandmother found within 
Piney Grove West, and I went back home to that, and I created a collage that visualized what exactly salvation looked within my life, and it's built upon the land which my grandfather established. So the print itself is made from handmade paper sourced from my grandfather's property, and his labor reflects my great-grandfather's labor, Mr. Jake Reed, about how he instilled these spiritual principles within my grandmother and how she passed that down to my mother and how my mother instilled principles into our family. And that level of ascension is all that cradles me within this life and guides me. So this installation titled Whole Note, Rest Note, Bless Yah and Black Gold is to pay homage to the people and community that have brought up what I know to be the truth for myself, but also to affirm others to follow suit to their own spirituality and ground themselves in their own knowing because it's, 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 these are trying times and it's a spiritual warfare out here for me before anything else. And this, the work is surrounding by the Psalms 147. And I'm, a, I'm just gonna read a few verses, seven verses from Psalms 4, 147. Praise Yah, for it is good to sing praise to our God, for it is pleasant and beautiful. Yah built up Jerusalem, he gathers together the outcasts of Israel, heals the brokenhearted, binds their wounds, he counts the number of stars, he calls them by their name. Great is Yah, and mighty in powder, his understanding is infinite. Yah lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked to the ground. He sings, excuse me, sing to Yah thanksgiving. Sing praises to the harp to our God. So I'm just existing within those words. So every time I praise in private, it's with my harmonica. And as I come in here, I do the same because just living in gratitude is all I can do. And Hallelujah, hallelujah. And this, every, that, those words just resonate within my spirit of how my grandmother uh, sung to us. And it's just one song, and I'm just gonna sing a little hymn. It goes, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, you know the storm. Passing over, Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Beverly. I know you have to follow this. I know, because I cannot sing for you, Wade in the Water. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. And thank you to my artists. It's not easy being an artist these days. We feel everything, and there's a lot to feel. Um, but, oh, that is me, Giles, take me to the river. Um, I grew up in North Carolina, and I had relatives that knew Bearden's grandmother. So I felt a connection there. But Bearden's Carolina shout rekindled my interest in river baptisms. And I realized that my ancestors, long before they were being baptized in York County rivers, they were being baptized in Africa, in the Ashan River. And so I felt like Bearden really captured that whole spiritual scene, what baptism is really about. And so when I created my character, Giles, um, that's a real relative of mine that was on the Jeremiah Blaylock plantation in the 1830s. And so I used this artwork to elevate Guile 
to another space to take him out of that situation that he was in. Um, I love the way Bearden used his cubistic style of the people surrounding the little boy being baptized. And so it's not unusual to find uh, Yoruba symbols in my work. Uh, those are Guile's ancestors helping him to transition during this baptism. Um, and the garment he's wearing, um, I use a lot of reclaimed um, garments in my quilts. I got that from my grandmother. She taught me that the smallest piece of fabric can hold generations of stories. And so when you see my quilts, I do acknowledge the preciseness and ingenuity of the traditional quilts, but I also add my own aesthetics to the quilts. And while I was creating this piece, I was having a lot of emotional feelings of what was going on in Gaza. More children were dying. And so I got spray paint, which I've never used before. And I actually spray painted on my quilt. And it is not easy because I didn't know. Um, you make it look easy. You make it look easy. Uh, but you have to buy these special nozzles. I didn't know that. I went to Lowe's and picked up. Just, no. They don't tell me that. They don't tell you that, but I had already spray painted my quilt. It looked good. Well, thank you. Because I had to start roping off my spray paint. But it was a way for me to uh, get out of a lot of emotions. That's what I love about creating art. And I'm so appreciative of Bearden. His work, when you see it, you really have to look at it very closely and for a good length of time to be able to see all the generations that are there supporting each other as they're going through this baptism. And um, so, yeah, I enjoyed the project, and I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the exhibition. Thank you. Thanks, Beverly. Thank you. First and foremost, I would like to give uh, honor and glory to the Most High. Second, I would like to give my thanks to the Mint Museum A&M Zion Baptist Church for inviting me out here today. Um, if you could, open your phones to the book of Instagram, chapter stories. There might be somebody who wants to hear this word. If you would be say amen. I said, say amen. amen. All right, y'all with me, church? <laughs> Blessed assurance. Yes, and on the eighth day, man had already messed up. He went back to God and asked for forgiveness. She told him, strip down to the booty meat and become one with the water. The clack of her acrylic set split the heavens, and with a gentle touch, she filled his beating heart with the rhythm of Ivis K's baseline. Born again, better than ever, baptized in the funk. Everybody has come before me and talked about the process of creating their peace. I want you to know the process does not matter. What matters to you tonight is being a conduit to manifest the things that need to exist at the times that they need to be. The same God I serve is the same one that served Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Billy Goat. They stood before the king, a man of power, gold, capitalism. Mm -hmm. They faced the ops, the police, the military, a political state that did not want to see them succeed. He threw them into a furnace, told them to crank that shit up. Cranked it up so high that the guards around it died from the heat. 
One was smart enough to go back to the, one was smart enough to go back to the king and say, "You put three in. I see four. He went to see for himself. He was amazed at what he saw. They cut the flames down. The boys walked out. They ain't smell like what they went through. If you're not getting the analogy for being a black person in America, that's what we're talking about right now. Um, this piece is quintessential to my existence in America. To be black is a spiritual experience. There's no way God will put you through this much hell in America if something wasn't promised on the other side. And baptized or not, I know it's something better when I'm gone. Can I get an amen? amen? Can I get an amen? amen. That's more like it. Wow, that's a lot to follow up. <laughs> um, I do want to thank, um, it was a very humbling experience being a part of this group and seeing everybody's work. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Jen. And um, So my work, um, I responded to several things in Bearden's piece. Um, while we had opportunity to view the pieces, and I really enjoyed going back between the Carolina shout and the baptism and like seeing the differences. One thing that video offers me is being able to combine those together, um, the passing of the time, the ritual. Um, so, and I would like to think that possibly Bearden would be working in video right now because uh, it's such an experimental medium. The, other part was this idea of a place. Carolina is my adoptive home, um, and thinking how Bearden is always attributed as Carolina as his home, how we see our home in a little bit romantic, nostalgic sense. So I was thinking, what is my adopted home to me? And it is ritual. It is the rituals that we create our, every day. So the video come together from 10 second, uh, snippets from my daily walk. Um, I walk the same path every day, probably sometimes twice a day, and the meditative nature that that took along. And there's a little bit of my doggie in there because <laughs> she's a big part of it as well. So, yeah. Um, and the title comes, it's the actual title of the place, um, Common Ground, um, which sometimes probably if you look that the history wasn't as common <laughs> for many, so. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Okay, we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, so I thank you, first of all, for all of your words. Um, John gave me a list of questions to ask you all, um, but honestly, all of you said something we said a lot of things that I found specifically very profound that tie to the works. And so I'd actually like to pull some of your comments out and ask each of you individually to maybe address something that you said as it relates directly to the Bearden work and to the piece you did. Um, so when I say we'll see how this goes, I mean time-wise, because I do want to make sure that we leave time for Q&A. Um, so Juan, I'm going to start with you. Um, and I'm going to loop back to the Bearden for a second. And uh, there's going to be a lot of toggling because I want to make sure we bring that back up. Um, so again, I was really pleased that you brought in the music component and that tension and balance between the, the entertainment life, the juke joint, the bars, the, you know, just getting together and having a good time, and the church service where we... Um, maybe repent for what we did at the jig joint and the bar and the, um, it's all merged together. Um, but also the figures are always really important in beard and even though they're all being clipped from different sources, and that's something that I'm gonna probably talk about with all of you, um, there's always somehow an echo to Bearden and his family. And then your works are very specifically you, like those silhouettes are of your, head silhouette. Um, and so that resonance of your presence as sort of always defining 
the the people in your in your um, compositions. I wanted to ask if there was any echo, and you knew Bearden, which is the other component of this question. So did that sort of history in Bearden of kind of coalescing all of these figures that didn't look the same but were relating to sort of like a oneness affect your work, which is a oneness, but doesn't, like if I didn't know that, I wouldn't know that these were all the same silhouette coming together. Well, actually, um, I did my first head um, I believe it was 1967, 68. And it was my head, and there was a word bubble coming out that says, I am black. Mm -hmm. And I was simply identifying myself in a particular way to know, I wanted you to know who I was, mm -hmm. where I was from, and it all tied to the, um, the civil rights moment, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Later, uh, that head evolved into one that talked about Aunt Jemima, mm. and then later it became a more universal head. Mm -hmm. um, and now when I talk about it, I'm, I'm talking about us as in terms of how we survive in American culture, and I said, you know, everything we ever were or will be takes place there first. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a book that came out some years ago um, that looked at African Americans in a particular way, but it was a body with no head, because mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. all about labor. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really need to think. It was not about intellect. So all the hairs that I make, while they're not, they're representative of me and they're representative of everyone that I know, mm -hmm. have known, will know. It's also about their intellect mm -hmm. and everything that they bring to the table in a particular way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of that comes into play. And talking about James P. Johnson mm -hmm. and those uh, Saturday nights, mm -hmm. I always thought of church as being just as celebratory. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what Carolina Shout's all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good time. Mm -hmm. And if you ever go to the right church and listen to the right music, while there's a difference in terms of meaning, it is really a good time. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of partying. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're praising God in a particular kind of way, but it's all good. So that's sort of where all that's coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you probably will have to leave before we get back to you, so can I just ask you one follow-up? Sure. Can you speak directly to how Bearden affected you, both as a young artist and as, as a colleague? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing I loved most was his ingenuity, his uh, creativity, his willingness to experiment, to try mm -hmm. things. Um, and as with most of us, uh, some things worked, some things did not. Mm -hmm. And that was okay. And the last time I was in his studio, uh, we were looking at things and he said, well, you know, I love the idea that he works so small, mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. Occasionally did a few large pieces and all that, and occasionally others made larger pieces for him. Mm -hmm. And that was great. But for the most part, he made a lot of very small work that was very intimate, very mm -hmm. personal. And in that way, I've attempted to do the same thing with my work. Mm, that's true, yeah. yeah. Um, just a little promotional moment. The Mint just purchased a really stunning Bearden collage that is, it's like five inches by, I think, three inches. It's tiny, and you have to get up really right. close. And it's, it's a brothel scene in New Orleans, and so that intimacy, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. It'll be on view, it'll be on view this summer. We just got it, yeah. As soon as we're able to get in the galleries, we will. Um, but yeah, it's, to your point, we forget because we're so used to seeing these larger works in the prints that they were meant to be small so, and intimate. So many small pieces. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately what it was all about for him. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Juan. Um, so, Carla, um, yes. I know Juan. Thank you so much, Ron. Let's give him another. Yeah. Um, so I'm just running through and kind of pulling something out of what everyone said and giving them a 
just like maybe a little deeper dive into just I'm catching you up on what happened will you <laughs> okay um, so Carla um, what people are not seeing in this image is that there is a dense narrative that is also written on the back that relates to the story you told of growing up in Charlotte growing up in um, the church specifically friendship Baptist and I wanted you to yeah talk because about that. like to be given an opportunity like this and you're from Charlotte so let's go ahead and put a heartbreaking reminder in front of everyone in the year of our Lord of 2024 if you are a Charlotte native and you were born below the poverty line you will stay below the poverty line therefore because I was born a Charlotte native below the poverty line I am destined to stay below the poverty line in the city of Charlotte. Does everybody understand that? That's how the mechan mechanics and really the true economy of the city works out against black people, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, Friendship is one of the oldest black churches in Charlotte. I will put it up there with St. Paul, I will put it up there with First Baptist, and I will also put it up there with the AME Zion Church that's downtown. I can't remember the name of it, but I know my cousin preached over there. You got me? So black people are inherently in and out of the church space. The one thing that people say to make it nice and palatable to American culture is that it was a community space. Mm. No, it was a safe haven because America is a violent place. Therefore, every now and then, in order for me to get a solid chin check, I need to revisit a space that I ran away from for so long and eventually return to. At 40, you're not gonna find me in elevation. That's not my church. You got it. But I'm only interested and invested in that which is considered traditional African American culture. And the only way I could get to respecting and understanding the complexities of the Sunday service choir and how back to life was even composed for present context was to remember that truly my first favorite gospel song was Blessed Assurance, all right? Because my grandma would sing it and she would play it. And my uncle was so proud to be a pastor. Like everything about this painting for me is steeped in memory. And the only reason why people get to hear a deeper meaning in it today is because I love and respect Jen that much. <laughs> the memory of my grandmother brought me to Clark's sisters because of a mix that Dammit Wesley did. That mix led me to a song on Jay-Z's album, but I didn't want to hear Beyonce sing it. I wanted to go back to the original. I'm not in the beehive, I just sit outside, okay? You know? And from there, that got me to back to life. This was my first time using color this was my first time truly seeing my handwriting as an abstracted mark in this very gestural space. Technically, everyone in this room and all of the people that have passed through the gallery since it's been there, you are truly looking at a journal entry as if it's a page out of a book. Because I'm not really figure-based. I, I enjoy it every now and then. But all of my paintings are just free thoughts because I don't get to be free. I have to be reserved. If I stand, on my business, somebody will say I'm aggressive. I'm not aggressive, baby, I am assertive. Aggression means that you feel like you're gonna be harmed. So because I am assertive, you take that as aggression. When in the reality, everything I do in my life is based in the church, to give back to my community, to educate black and brown children that look like me, to make sure that everybody can understand how they learn, and that they can freely express themselves too. Because what I choose to leave behind is an image for people to contemplate and spend time in front of and try to figure out what I've done. Because I'm not too great at explaining it. I just did an okay job today. You did great. Um, thank you, Carla. Are you gonna keep working in color? Yeah. Good. I love it. So Susan, you spoke of pessimism in your work, um, and I, I think we all can agree there's a, there is a great optimism in Bearden's, and so that tension in your response 
very much comes through. But I wanted to ask you about the element of water, which, I mean, um, as you said, these figures could be emerging, they could be coming to life. But I feel like water is always representative as this opportunity for cleansing, for, for a new opportunity. Do you not use water in that way or consider water in that way? Well, I recently was going back through some writing about some mm -hmm. older work and it dawned on me that I have used water imagery for quite a long time. Yeah. And I've used it in different ways. Uh, more recently, I've been concerned with the degradation of our waters, mm -hmm. with the environmental destruction mm -hmm. of our waters, and also with the rising water levels mm -hmm. that we have. So um, I'm, I suppose it may wash things away, mm -hmm. but I'm not thinking about that. I mean, if it is washing things away, it's holding on to those pollutants mm -hmm. that have been washed away. So it's damaging the water itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really thinking about a tension between the beauty of the blue, the bright mm -hmm. colors, and then these forms that mm -hmm. are very angular and mm -hmm. Many of them look like they could have been from an erector set. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know if erector sets still exist, but mm -hmm. they do. They do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's yeah. that's my use of water. But I mean, the first thing I wanted to do with this piece was to paint that blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Tom, oh, yeah. <laughs> so Tom, I had a similar question for you, um, not just about the use of blue and the use of water in the work, um, but I wanted to shift it a bit towards collage. Um, you said something uh, really beautiful about um, the connections and how to make sense of the past. And um, also, I just want to say, I love your comment that families are really good at reminding us who we were, but also um, who we can be. Um, and all of that, I feel, is very much in that Carolina Shout piece, because even if they're not family members necessarily, that community is coming together and that support um, it's, there's a lineage there and a legacy there, but it's also all about coming forward and going forward. Um, so, and the past is being brought into the present and then moving forward into the future. So I wanted to ask you about this idea of how to make connections in the work and what you were, how that was all being kind of folded into your work, into this image, through the construction of it. Thank you. It, uh, I wanted to pay tribute to Bearden's tradition of, of being really thoughtful, but at the same time playful. Mm -hmm. And for him, it seemed that collage was a really great way to represent community mm -hmm. because the, there's so many images that are borrowed but reimagined, and the, every, the, everything's in a state of becoming in his collages. Right, so mm -hmm. different smiles, different faces, different voices, but they have a familiarity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in growing up, there were a lot of times that we all came together, and I come from a big, big family. Mm -hmm. And so there was always something going on, right? And one of the moments that I really think about and, and smile about my aunt is that she, uh, there's always something going on. I was about to graduate high school, and she said, Tom, please don't go into art. You won't, you're going you're gonna to hurt the people you love. It's not going to be any good, and that's, that's fine. Just, so just stop it. And then she like ran off to like something was breaking in the other room and, and going on. Mm -hmm. and, and I smiled because of the backdrop when she was saying this was um, a homemade theater where they would always come together and, and put on a skit and make something up. And so in a way, I kind of, I loved her for her honesty and her brevity 
but uh, I didn't quite believe her. And I, I was always kind of stubborn, so I, I went ahead and did it and took the plunge. And I hope that she a appreciates that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think about coming together in community and family reunions or those weekends together where you have a plan and it never goes right, but somehow like, like that's what you talk about. Um, and and the, the collage of different people that come in and out of their, our lives and mm -hmm. you know, you go back home and there's like, oh, they only talk to you about the point that you left. And it's like, oh, you remember that? And, and those time of fates, and, and it's all beautiful and it's sort of painful at the same time as you become somebody else. It's always a state of coming. So for me, uh, kind of a double tribute to just the, the collage nature of what mm -hmm. Bearden was doing and uh, just the approach of every bird is a person, um, not quite perfect yet, uh, but beautiful in its, in its way of becoming. So parts of those, uh, without really asking my daughter, are like old pieces of her artwork. We've got stacks and bins of things, so I don't think she's gonna miss them, hopefully. <laughs> um, others are pieces of uh, old cyanotypes and collages. I'm really intrigued mm -hmm. by that. This kind of way of ca capturing an image you know, as a, as a photographer too, and just experimenting with a lot of things. So for me, in this moment, collage made sense. Mm. Thank you. So Malik, I wanted to talk to you about material as well, um, and also kind of playing off that collage idea. Um, so everyone else, including the Bearden work, is two-dimensional, and you've pulled this into a three-dimensional space, but in essence, it's also a collage. Like, all of these pieces lay on top of each other, but there's also the pieces that aren't there for us when we come in, which includes your spiritual process in making the work, in coming back and reactivating the work, but also the words that resonate when you're making the works and that still kind of echo, which I thought was, like I love that you were in this because of that echo that's constantly reverberating in your work. Um, it seemed like the perfect synergy with John's show. Um, so I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about that. Like, do you think of these works as a collage, and when you were looking at Bearden's collage, did you, did you see that material parallel? Yes. When I was looking at Romero Bearden's work, I was like, man, this man is nice at collage. So <laughs> I'm already running away from painters and, and, and like finding courage in that technique, but the technique in the painting that he placed into his collage, I was like, how can I do this for myself mm. within my medium, my knowing? And I drew towards digital collage. So the uh, image that's engraved onto the paper is a digital collage, a uh, double exposure of my grandmother's uh, church, uh, Piney Grove West Missionary Church, and um, my grandfather's property in the woods. So bringing back to the point of salvation, which I was really honing in on, being from south of Charlotte, that salvation within those two spaces for me mm -hmm. while entangling the word. Mm -hmm. So the baptism of the voices and prayers and the shouts within the church of relieving yourself within, away from society and how they treat mythified people. Um, so, and then I, I, I'm also wanting to bring home this new process that I'm in of wreath making. And that is sourced also from my grandfather's property. Mm -hmm. And so to bring back to Romero Bearden's, how he used Carolina Shout, this musical composition, I was thinking about the song and praise within mm -hmm. the church and then outside the church for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so the, whole, the wreath is a whole note and I am using the whole note within the collage as a way of addressing the ascension and praise, mm. um, but also these rests, because mm. within the collage, you can see that I have inscribed Piney Grove, rest, um, Piney Grove West Missionary Baptist Church within this block as a rest note. And we can just sit down and you know, be and you know, look each other in the eyes and say, we got each other because this is the safe haven. Yeah. Um, and 
so the wreath is from that and the consecrated staff is from my creative practice of um, really just living through the word of Psalms 23, verse four. Although I walk through the shadow of valley and death, I fear no evil, because his rod and staff comforts me. And during my own experience of reaffirming myself and reaffirming my relationship with the Most High, that came through, that uh, creative blessing. Um, I, I, I thank y'all for that every day. And uh, the paper, that's also paper sourced from my grandfather's property and my gra grandmother's property and my grandma's property, my, excuse me, my aunt's property. And uh, the leaves are just, I don't know, I just remember just playing in the leaves with my brothers and how important that is. Um, and this, the podium itself is an altar, so I desire to, you know, allow people to come into it, but also recognize this is a private space, but also you can activate and participate with, with, with it. Um, so I find myself coming in periodically to praise and to leave, you know, all that, my tidings. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's how I would address that. And uh, the courts, that's also from my grandfather's property and a reflection of purity and just cleansing and just uh, abundance of just the importance of land and the legacy of, so thank you to my grandfather for all his hard work to just establish a kingdom for, for us, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Malik. Thank you. So Beverly, this is also kind of bridging material and narrative. Um, so you spoke of the legacy, not only of Giles in your image, this relationship to your biography, but also the idea of each piece of scraps of fabric holding and generating their own stories. And this was something that Bearden also looked at the images that he took from magazines and newspapers and his work and would collage together in this idea of layering the stories to create a larger narrative, but that each individual piece, even if it was just a finger, also had this deep, deep meaning. So I wanted to ask you about how you go about selecting the fabric. Does it speak to you in some way? Is there like a similar kind of call and response? Um, and though Malik didn't talk about this directly here, I know we talked about before with the material that you use, but like, do you have that kind of relationship to your material and as you build your quilts? Yeah. And um, when you mention call and response, like the writing I have on the garment, take me to the river, mm -hmm. and it's being repeated, mm -hmm. it's somewhat playing off of that call and response. Um, but yes, I select my fabrics I collect a lot of vintage fabrics, so it's common to find nostalgic and uh, reclaimed garments on my mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. But also, I like to incorporate patterns from the Underground Railroad. Yeah. And so, you can see at the top of the quilt, the bow tie. Oh, and yeah. that was one of those hidden codes during that time when slaves were trying to escape from the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, that secret message might be uh, dressing up and putting on a bow tie and going to church. Mm -hmm. And that's when the messages would come out, the next step and how to prepare for the next stage. Mm -hmm. But also I use uh, crazy quilts mm -hmm. and that's where the pattern is like meandering kind of all over the place. Uh, that's how my grandmother's quilts used to be. And I don't know how true this is, but uh, in my family, they would say having the meandering patterns, the patchwork uh, would confuse evil spirits and they would not be able to stay inside your fabrics. And sometimes that story comes from Africa as well. So I don't know if it's really true, but I never take any chances. So in, in all of my quilts, I'm having like this patchwork, yeah. which is sometimes referred to as offbeat phrasing. 
it's uh, just like jazz notes that yeah. <laughs> again to confuse any kind of evil spirits trying to get into the mix. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and the garment that she has on. Uh, my, my grandmother used to use reclaimed clothing in her quilt. She didn't have a lot of money. It took me a while to realize like I was sleeping under my aunt's uh, discarded dresses. And, and so I love to add that into my work as well. Mm -hmm. um, the figures behind her, they're almost like these Igungun figures that existed in the Yoruba culture. And it's uh, a ritual costume that was layered with fabric. Mm -hmm. And I connect with that so well with my grandmother and my quilts, uh, using symbolically all the strips of fabric to like hide what's underneath. And igungun actually means concealed power. Mm -hmm. So I love incorporating all of that into my quilts. So yeah, my fabrics are chosen based on my African culture and Southern roots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Beverly. Oh, thank you. Um, so, damn it, Wesley. We're going to move away from material a bit, but I want to talk about water again. Um, so, you, um, I, and also something Carla said about the church being really the only safe space um, in not just the South, but across the country, across the world for black people. And damn it, Wesley, your comment to be black in America is a spiritual experience. Um, and clearly that's embodied in your painting, but I wanted to ask, is your figure emerging from the water? Or is your figure submerging into the water? And, or is it a floating space in between? Does it matter? Um, but that idea of, of water as something that will drown or support. First off, uh, I want everybody in the room, look at your neighbor. I want you to look at your neighbor. I want you to say, neighbor. neighbor. I want you to say, neighbor. neighbor. Wake up! Yeah. Don't play with me tonight. Okay. <laughs> now that we are here, we're attentive. Great. This is what we call a call and response. Um, uh, one of me and Carla's artist friends, uh, Doreeman Jones, first kind, he's going to be showing tomorrow at the Mint Randolph. Um, when asked about his current practice or just how he's doing, his response was, I'm just being black. Mm -hmm. and, existing. and existing. And that is exhausting as it is. So sometimes just being, the state of being, is enough work. Uh, when it comes to this picture in particular, um, the narrative that I created, uh, the passage that I read on the first go around, um, was a derivative of Langston Hughes' creation story. Uh, growing up in Greenville, South Carolina, attending Tabernacle Baptist Church on 400 South Hudson Street, aka the Greasy Corner, a quite radical and militant African American church. Uh, that is over 175 years old, um, I came across more sinners than saints in the building. Those people were just merely existing. Uh, there was a lot of cursing within the basement where the kitchen was. Uh, there were a number of unsavory characters that would come to, that would come to church in Coupe de Ville's rims on their vehicles, but they were godly. They were respectable. They were loving, they were kind, and they were all looking for refuge within this building. Um, this piece is almost representative of my experience in that church. This is an old church with red carpets, red pews, okay? Stained glass windows. All the while, whoever hired the artist put a white Jesus in this extremely black facility, right? At no point did anybody question the black, Je the white Jesus, but we all knew that the religion that we abided by and the person that we prayed to looked like us. Mm. To a degree that, despite how many men they put in the pool pit, it was a matriarchy. The women made the decisions. The women kicked out the pastors. The women 
lock the doors. And if you want to do a little research, I can give you some history on it, but the church was essentially cursed because they turned against the pastor, they locked him out, and he rebuked the building and put a curse on the damn church. We worship here often. So when it comes to putting together this piece, it was just essentially me trying to weave together, well, not me. I'm in a relationship with my materials. I let the painting make itself. Who am I to tell something what it's going to be, right? I'm just a conduit to the process, right? This piece is everything that I have lived through manifest. You can't convince me that God is a man, if not just a body of water. Why would the all-knowing, all-being be a mess like me and or you? If you haven't turned on the TV, people don't know what the fuck they doing. It's a goddamn mess down here, right? <laughs> this can't be the same image that I'm talking about or being representative in the Bible, right? So um, as, far as, as far as this right here, um, whether you're floating, whether you're getting in the water, whether you're getting out of the water, all that matters is that you touched it. Mm. It's transfiguration. It's transformative. We put too much weight and pressure on the how versus the end result. And I think that's going to be our saving grace. All right? Mm. There you go. Thank you. I'm trying to be optimistic right now. Thank you, Tim. So, Lily, I wanted to ask you about that idea of, of trans, transmorphing, transfiguration that happens in daily spaces. You, wrote, you spoke about these videos come from your daily walks. How are you finding the spiritual in those spaces, and how do you see it as sort of I mean, it's coming through your work literally in these images, but is it something that you're trying to hold on to in some way with the work that you're making? Much as Bearden was trying to hold on to those narratives with his collages. Um, so there is definitely this idea that art elevates everyday life. And um, what is the best thing by slowing down and really looking like what are the things that make you happy daily. And um, yes, I'm a little bit of a absurdist, so I think religion is one of the paths to transcending the absurdity of the life. Another one, acceptance. So for me, the daily rituals, and it's an acceptance of the absurdity of life and finding just beauty and joy in the everyday. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Lily. <laughs> that was, that was short. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to keep it on uh, the Beard and Peace, but I'm going to open it up to the audience. All right, any questions? Any anything? The door to the church hall. The door to the church hall. Open it up for the past damage. Oh, my bad. I put it on mute. Turn the green light on. Oh, yeah. Work is so important. Walking through series of stills. Um, and but there's something that feels like wind in your piece, too. I mean, there's like the wind is blowing and you're having an experience on multiple levels. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> She's not giving you more, Krista. Okay. Someone else. Yep. Bye. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I'm new to Charlotte, and I'm also uh, polytheistic, so I have a little, not much background with all this stuff, but I did want to ask, how do you, so I'm very, you know, family's not from here, right, so, and you guys all are of b backgrounds who are either uh, similar to the background of the U.S. or have been here for generations, so how do you reconcile, uh, and, and also background, my religion has been the same for 
you know, a thousand years. So there's not been a change. Whereas for you guys, there has been a change, subtle or otherwise. So for a Yoruban, the religion has shifted, right, from um, the native African religion all the way down. How do you reconcile that change over time? You know, you're part of the church or maybe a sect of Christianity that didn't exist as the years went on, and then you're creating art on this community that has, you know, shifted over time. And I, I don't know personally how that fills you and how do you think of your past during the change? I know it's... Bev and uh, everybody else too, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for me, uh, black Christianity or being in a black church is a wholly separate experience from being Catholic, Protestant, or being in a white church, right? So for a lot of African Americans in the South, the black church is a cultural experience, okay? Um, there is a lot of deviation from what's in the book. Um, there are some theologians that will argue that the Bible is essentially split into two theologies. Black people abide by the liberation theology, okay? So we focus more on the stories of Moses getting out of Egypt and Jesus liberating people with free miracles, food, medicine, healing, that kind of stuff, right? Um, we are currently at a point where capitalism has breached into the walls of the church, and we're only speaking prosperity. And I'm about to say a very naughty word right now. People are currently preaching the prosperity of Israel, i.e. white supremacy, the ideology of this belongs to me and I'm going to take it because it's been given to me. And this is where things branch off, okay? So for black ideologies, we are still very much focused on the liberation from slavery, the liberation of racism, from being uh, underneath the thumb of oppression and kings and capitalism, all right? Um, what you believe on the other side, whether Jesus was a real person or not, whether you believe that there is a God in heaven who is going to give you access to an afterlife doesn't matter as much as the words of affirmation that something is waiting for you, that you can overcome the disparities in society that exist and have existed. For us, seeing a figure like Christ be murdered by a police state and a Roman government that sits with me, I understand it. Every culture has their beliefs. Nobody is above anybody to say it's wrong. We can all try to figure it out. Or we can keep arguing about the same shit until we all poison ourselves with lead, the internet, and the sun is blows. I don't know which is going to be worse. It doesn't really matter. We're on a floating rock in space. We're going to die eventually. Do what you want. You know, oh, and so like I, I do think that it would be fantastic if you and Malik chimed in in answering that question mm -hmm. because of the things that both of you have discussed as it relates to your works. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. I, I, think, I think that that would do bruv a solid mm -hmm. because the biggest word that's missing from the conversation, mm -hmm. which is one that has to be taught to two thirds of the people in here mm -hmm. about our relationship with Christianity mm -hmm. is who do? Yes. Um, yeah, excellent question. I concur. Sometimes when I'm creating, I'm not always articulating what I'm actually feeling. It just comes out in my art. But your question and your answer to that make me realize that, um, yeah, I'm going back. I'm seeing the church just like my ancestors saw it as a way to escape bondage, um, my quilt guiles, this baptism is taking him on a whole nother plane, a spiritual experience. And this is, um, I guess it's like DNA because uh, I went there automatically. I went all the way back to the Alsan River, yeah. And then I have these igungungs flanking him and helping him to be able to go to the next stage. So 
I grew up in the church, but this is what I am experiencing. This is what really is at the root of it for me when you talk about church or religion. It's more of a spiritual thing. So Malik, jump into the question as well and explain why the importance, why spirituality throughout your installation works mm -hmm. are so important. And mm -hmm. it's so important to tell that story of my family, my family, my family. Yes. In 2024, I find that some of the artists that I find to be most intriguing are young black artists, no matter their background, mm -hmm. but young black artists that understand fully where they come from. Yeah. And they are not ashamed. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. And so I think the more that they create and they creating from their hearts and some of that research, um, it helps you to appreciate that journey. And a lot of young people, they're learning how to appreciate that journey. But um, yeah, very interesting. I did not really realize that, but you can see it definitely in my artwork. Hmm. Oh, it's Black right. History Month. That's Might as well now. These conversations because it helps me to articulate what I'm doing. Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, I I echo with a lot of what everyone's saying here, and I believe that for me, um, spirituality is about knowing how the abuse of the truth have been utilized for oppression of a people. Um, Pine Grove West has been established for one, more than 150 years. And the, the, but we have to also take knowledge that the word has been used to oppress black people like, oh, you were supposed to be of the enslaved. And it's, it's really about breaking this narrative of what the word is in assessing truth. It's about truth and discerning truth from the Christian standpoint of following the example of perfection and redemption and forgiveness and recognizing that we are we all are from the fallen fruit. So it's about standing in that power and grace. But I believe through my work I am working through that uh, re-educating myself about what is truth, um, but also not shunning and shaming someone of their own spiritual journey, because everyone's on their own spiritual journey. And the only, the greatest Yahshua, he showed love. So love church transcends all things. It transcends judgment. It transcends ignorance. It, it just allows a person to be. Uh, and for, for me, being grateful for how my grandmother is, being grateful for how my grandfather is, different relationship with spirituality. But when y'all talk to them, they say, prayer is important. It has guided me. So when I look at my father's, my grandfather's legacy, he had, he is, his life is blessed because he's able to provide for a generation after him. And that's, that's biblically written if you're walking a Christ-like path. So um, it's important to know that from a Western tradition of learning from example from the external of Christ, but from the East, Eastern tradition is knowing that Christ is within, and it's about how you share that, you, you, you expand upon that. And we want to, I think, for, for me, it's, it's about finding that balance, but not getting to subscribe to things that I'm not knowledgeable, knowledgeable of, because I, I, do, I do like run away from hoodoo, you know? I'm not sure, but, but I know it's of myself, because I know it is of my history. Because we needed something to protect ourselves from the white people that was killing us. Yes. How can you be someone that remembers an original practice, a concept, an idea of a thing, 
And then what do you do to cover that the thing exists itself, right? So if we think about it in context, we're American, so we watch television, we watch movies, uh, they show a picture of Papa Legba, you know? Or they have a concept of who Ishu is, right? And these are all characters that we will find within the mythologies that come out of West Africa because I cannot pinpoint anything specifically because we haven't even hit on the Dogon and how the Dogon predate even Christianity in itself. And who is the dude that uh, followed the stars? Who is that, Galileo? I'm supposed to learn about Galileo, but you ain't tell me about the Dogon? Right? So when we look at all of these multi-layered things and the things that we have consumed, we believe that, oh, if it's voodoo or African in nature, oh my God, it's evil. You're gonna come and drag me to hell because I watched the James Bond movie too many times. And now this has become truth in my mind and you didn't really think about where the story comes from. With hoodoo, for the South specifically, and I'm not even gonna talk about voodoo, because voodoo come out of Louisiana, and then we go across the water, and then it could possibly be Santeria, and it could possibly be something else, in which the smoke was that of Christianity in these fields. In our house, it was the words that resonated with us to make us feel whole. And for your answer to your question, because I knew I was going to come in last, yes, black people do have a love-hate relationship with Christianity. Right? Because we know the things that we know. But if, because free will is a choice, no one is forced to believe a thing, correct? But for the African American specifically, we have flipped it into a story of salvation. We have flipped it into a story of forgiveness for us. Because when you live an entire life where someone says you're the bad, you begin to believe that you are the bad. You were never the bad. You were always someone, a human. And for African Americans, a large majority of them in this part right now, Jesus looks like me. Good times, 1970s. Florida Evans couldn't believe that Michael wanted a black Jesus because he had to be so pristine and clean. And then we get to 2023, 2024, and we have the Book of Clarence, which made me so emotional because it is the Christianity story I grew up with. I did not grow up with the Jim Caziville. I did not grow up with the Mel Gibson interpretation of who Christ is. I grew up with black people teaching me that I am like Clarence and that if I listen to these stories, I too can perform miracles and walk on water. Me, the human, not the African-American, took me 45 years, 40 years to believe it. And that's my personal opinion. Because as a human, I respect everybody's perspective if you respect mine. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually think that's a perfect note to end on, especially listening to everything Carla was saying and looking up at Bearden's, Bearden's picture. It's perfect. It's perfect. Don't say Paul, Paul. No. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so thank you for everyone being here tonight. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Carla, for taking over the mic. <laughs>